Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm sorry to, to ask you to wrap it up, but I just want to make sure that we have time. Um, we have maybe 15 or 20 minutes or so um, for discussion. So I just want to okay. make sure that people in the audience have, have a chance to ask questions and um, maybe that'll feed into um, sure. additional, yeah, additional materials ahead. here. Um, so for those of you in the audience, if you do have questions, you can either use the raise hand feature and we can call on you and you'll be able to unmute yourself. Um, or you can type a type a written question in here. Um, so during the during the discussion, uh, Tim there had a, a greeting here from Tom Johnson. Says, "Hey Tim Weiskel, this is Tom Johnson here from Cambridge." Um, we had someone asking uh, one of the one of the clips that you showed was from um, RT, and they're sort of asking about the motivations and trustworthiness of the RT network. I know they're a, a Russian-owned um, media <laughs> yeah. company. That was a question that came in. It's a fully fully owned subsidiary of the Russian government, just as the. Most American media is a fully owned subsidiary of corporations. Yeah. It's not not to be trusted any more than the others. In other words, no, this is not a, a fount of, of truth. Um, all sources need to be critically assessed. If you want the, the further documentation, it's available on the website. Um, the, Deutsche Welle did a special on Ivory Coast slavery, um, which I've linked to, so you can, and you can triangulate uh, still more. There's another one from Al Jazeera. Um, uh, <laughs> and you can imagine there are statements all over the place from Nestle's on this. So anybody interested in doing research on it should look into it thoroughly. Yeah, I've, I've certainly encountered a number of similar, you know, critiques of, of Nestle coming from a number of sources, so it's not just the RT. Uh, source thing, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so I see a hand is up here from uh, Madia uh, Thompson. Madia Thompson. Yes. Um, hi, uh, Professor Maisel. I, You know, I'm trying to remain calm because I'm so excited to hear someone talking about places in West Africa, and particularly Cote d'Ivoire, where one... Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, where places are just... And so I'm very happy. I, was, I didn't turn, unfortunately, I was otherwise occupied, and so I couldn't see things from the beginning. But I was just wondering if you had been able to follow what, how, re how recently or uh, you've been, um, your or how recent your information is about the state of Ivorian agriculture now. And when I say recent, I mean since the disturbances of 2010. You know, no, it's yeah. it's not recent. I'm, I regret I have not been out to the field since. Um, one of the things that needs to be studied in detail, and maybe you can do it for us, <laughs> is the disturbances in 2010, like the Civil War, and it's pre, um, <laughs> what would we say, the preconditions for Civil War are, are intimately tied up with the slavery system that were immobilized during the colonial period uh, between the Baule and the people from the north. Um, you're, you may be acquainted with the kind of, um, basically the, the farming system that emerged was one that was a, a legacy of the slave trade. Slaves were brought from the northern part of the Ivory Coast uh, to the forested areas and were sold eventually down on the coast. But when that stopped, they were put to work. Um, largely through plantation systems that rendered profits to the owners of the land, the valley, uh, for one third of their total production. In other words, uh, northerners were given the chance to work on lands owned by the Baole and others in the south at the Um, but only in exchange for one third of their crop. And in that way, the, the resident populations in the south um, who claimed the land as prior occupants, uh, basically made money off of the, the indentured labor, shall we call it, of mm -hmm. those who had come in from the north. Now, that tension ultimately led to a huge divide between the north and the south and the breakout of, of a civil war. I have not brought up since. In fact, one of the tragedies of the civil war is that a lot of the documentation about the colonial period has been lost as the civ as the archives were destroyed. That's very interesting because that's a little bit of information that I don't have. Um, 
you've actually put a whole lot of things. It, it's Cote d'Ivoire is rather close to me in, in many ways, and I won't go into too much detail, but let's just say that my father spent many years there. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and there's certain things that I, as now as the academic, am somewhat interested in. Oh, good. Uh, and, you know, okay, so the other question, the follow-up question I had essentially was about the state of the rice programs, because you did ah. mention how how rice has now been, you suggested what I remember seeing when I was actually in, which was about many years ago, on a, working on a rice project. Right. Um, which is essentially that it had to, rice, in fact, had to become the one of the principal staples of the country. Right. Rice and acheke. Acheke is been, yeah. been, uh, <laughs> yeah. been developed as a manioc. Um, you know, as, again, this is a very interesting history of, of cassava or manioc or acheke as it's made into a local uh, consumable product. Um, that is introduced from the new world. And the history of all of the introductions uh, is fascinating. But you're right, there's been a, a um, concerted effort on the part of the government to expand the rice production uh, for local consumption, in part because they got caught in the in the 60s and depending on imports from China in, in an odd sort of way. When I was doing field work out there in the 70s, um, people were very proud of, of two things, big bags of China rice, and they would bring out for me little boxes of Uncle Ben's rice. <laughs> Uncle Ben was thought to be a successful American capitalist who had yeah. managed to get get rice into the Ivory Coast. And so they thought, as an American, I would love Uncle Ben's rice. <laughs> uh, I see. Oh, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. So we've had a couple uh, written questions come in. Um, the first one here is asking if you are encouraged by the growth of renewable energy worldwide, um, is it possible that agricultural inputs, fertilizers, et cetera, will be based on wind powered or solar powered production um, of inputs? Well, I hope so. I mean, we have to move as quickly as possible. Ultimately, you've got to run the whole thing on solar throughput. Um, the problem with doing that is that everyone else is realizing that simultaneously. And part of what I wasn't able to get to here was the way in which African land grabs are being um, undertaken now, not so much in the Ivory Coast, but particularly in Sierra Leone and in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, to produce palm oil uh, for the use <laughs> in European engines and diesel, diesel engines, and to produce maize um, for basically not human consumption, but for ethanol production. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. They're not exporting maize for ethanol production, but they're reducing the imports of maize, which a lot of countries had come to depend on, um, from the West, from European and American sources. Those imports are getting more scarce, therefore more price. And that is in part due to the switchover of maize production to ethanol production. So it's actually gotten worse since uh, the Obama years when ethanol production took off in the United States um, in 2008 uh, because of the subsidies provided for switching to ethanol production. So there, it's a global food system now studied in detail by people like Lester Brown uh, in such a way that basically Africa is at the end of a whip that is being cracked from some other part of the world. And food scarcities can emerge overnight uh, if as an example, it happened in 2008 when Russia decided not to export wheat. Uh, in the process, the price of wheat doubled and uh, lots of people went hungry in Africa. So that's part of what I wanted to get to, and we can talk about it at length at some other point. But basically, Africa has not gained its food self-sufficiency. It was encouraged for the colonial period afterward to get involved in the economics of comparative advantage. And as you grow cocoa, coffee, Bananas and like do more and more of that, and will provide you with the food stuff. So you get the flow from the African tropics of all the tropical goods to the northern countries, and all the staple foods coming down from the north, uh, surplus production um, to Africa. Now the trouble with that is that the import costs of that can't help but rise because they're dependent on fossil fuels, and in effect you're vulnerable to any disruption pandemics or any other kind in the international uh, trade system. Um, and the result is very quickly, whole portions of uh, Africa can be left, the word is not appropriate, high and dry, uh, but basically bereft of a food supply. 
Now, when you add on top of that the crises that are coming down the pike because of climate change and pandemics, you can see that Africa's agricultural sector is in real vulnerable uh, circumstances at this point. So I guess uh, this is very much related, but you know, do you believe that the fundamental challenges of food production are technical, um, that is something to be solved by engineers and technicians, or legal and political, that is to be addressed through policies and laws? Or to be more specific, if we address and ensure the local ownership of land and avoid corporate or foreign ownership of land, will we be in a better place in the future? Well, as they say, good luck with that. In other words, it, it's hard to figure out how you can, can stop a multinational at this point in this effort to grab land. That's happening. Um, in effect, there aren't any instruments strong enough. The UN is asking for voluntary restraint on, the, on this issue of land grabbing at this point. Um, but ultimately, the problems are neither technical nor political. They're ecological. And what's so tragic in Africa was pointed out by the Dutch ecologists back in the 1950s and 60s is that topsoil is being eroded and, and destroyed. Water sources are being um, poisoned and again um, destroyed. Um, the, the basic fundamentals of the agronomy of African production are being attacked at the same time that the variables, that is the wind and weather that is going to hit them, um, are being accentuated. Now, the, the problems that are expressed immediately are droughts and floods, right? In Mozambique or in Southern Africa, you can have droughts for some years and floods in other years, both of which devastate agriculture, right? And you get people driven off of, of farmland into in many cases, refugee camps or cities where they're having to consume greater and greater amounts of food that aren't produced in Africa, but are shipped in. Um, the dependency ratio, in effect, has shifted uh, very decidedly towards external dependence on, on food supplies. Now, if you do that too long, especially if it breaks out in civil war in many parts of Sudan and elsewhere in Ethiopia, um, and you get people in refugee camps long enough, the agricultural expertise is not passed down from one generation to another. And you're taking people out of the agricultural sector at the same time, that is, they're not learning how to grow things. At the same time, they're becoming dependent on an external resources for the food supply. So it's a, a real um, bind. And I'm not sure that the political structures are yet available. It's not just a matter of redistributing land or uh, putting in new incentives for locally grown foods and the like. Um, it really is a kind of structural problem that's far more fundamental and has to do with now the big reversal in international um, agricultural advice that has taken place in the last few years when they realized that economics of comparative advantage has driven these countries into real disasters. And they're now the new, the new uh, watchword for the international agricultural organizations is survivability, or as they're calling it, local sustainability. That is, we want to produce um, or encourage economies to invest in food self-sufficiency, right? Self-sufficiency. Well, wait a minute. that's where we started out in the uh, colonial period, if you recall, historically. People were disdainful in the colonial administrations of subsistence agriculture because it only produced for self-sufficiency, right? <laughs> they had to be encouraged to go into cash cropping, into export agriculture. Now, self-sufficiency is being seen as a good goal. Uh, how do you go to engineer that? That is, reduce the distance between production and consumption and valorize local production techniques and the intelligent use of local agricultural resources without depending upon vast amounts of fertilizers, tractors, and imported um, uh, petrol intensive systems, that's gonna have to be wound down. But its problem is located ultimately in the ecology of agricultural production, not the economics, the politics, or in fact, the technology being pushed by the petrol intensive um, efforts in the tradition of Norman Borlaug. 
Now, it's not fair to blame Norman Borlaug for everything that's come since the world food system, but by giving, in effect, a big leap forward for petro-intensive agriculture, he's placed large parts of Africa and certainly other parts of the third world in a very precarious circumstance uh, where more and more people are coming to depend on fewer and fewer crops grown in narrower and narrower regions with greater and greater subsidies from something we know is becoming more scarce, petroleum. It's becoming more scarce, which isn't its biggest problem. It's also having enormous system-wide impact in the CO2 it contributes to the atmosphere and therefore is changing um, the very circumstance of agriculture, that is the climate. So uh, you've got to wind it down and relocalize it. But the instruments we have are so, um, it's, it's like trying to uh, do dentistry with a jackhammer. <laughs> In effect, you're not going to be very effective uh, by just saying, well, we can pass a law or we can um, give out new incentives. They've got to be much more attentive to the local ecology of these things. So uh, Nat Treadway, who asked that first question, I should have mentioned that first, but uh, follow up to say, couldn't uh, local countries tax the heck out of corporate landowners, which it sounds like you're a little bit skeptical about that. Well, you could, but uh, again, good luck with that. I mean, if you think corporations are going to be um, neutral yeah, on the back, back to being heavily taxed. <laughs> yeah, he acknowledges that that's uh, maybe not feasible right now. Um, so we, had, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I see Tom Johnson has his hand up. So Tom, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, well, it's uh, great to hear and see uh, see and hear from everybody. Tim, I, I wonderful presentation. I especially like the way you frame uh, the formal topic within your personalized history of, of African studies. And I especially appreciate the way you honor uh, the ancestors of African his African studies. I uh, I was fortunate to buy Basil Davidson's video series when it was available and affordable. Uh, but also Daniel McCall, who never received the recognition he deserved. Uh, I reti he retired before I started to enter grad school at BU, but he always took an interest in me, and I really appreciate that. Uh, my question or comment uh, will um, sort of do continue doing what you're doing, which is placing. Uh, the details of your talk within the, within the broader context of African studies and global issues. Um, what I hear you saying is that it, re it resembles the uh, radical Afro-pessimism of uh, the 60s and 70s, Rene Dumont, um, uh, uh, Fence Fanon, and so forth, which is a contrast to you know the last 15 years or so of, let's say, cautious optimism about where Africa is going and where it is now. Um, and so I wanted to ask you if you if that is implicit or you want to make it explicit. And my guess is that uh, in a way, uh, uh, bo both views are true, but what we're seeing is uh, uh, some sectors of economy and society prospering while others remain left behind, uh, kind of an old story, but uh, with much more urgency with global climate crisis uh, uh, operating now. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. I think in general, you're quite right there that basically I was heavily influenced by people who observed what was going wrong early on and were swept aside by the euphemisms and um, hysteria, one might say, of growth economics, thinking that you could infinitely grow on a finite planet. Uh, that just can't happen. I mean, that's the new realism. It's not so much about Africa. It's about the recognition of the limits uh, of the human enterprise, basically. You can't, as Sir David Attenborough put it, you know, you can't have more people on the planet that can be fed. So you have to be attentive to how they're going to be fed. So I think we have time for one more quick question. I see that Jim McCann had a question here. Um, thank you, Tim. Um, the ecological context of food production links to climate change um, and this affects the land grab phenomenon. Can you address this? IPCC mapping directly addresses what are issues for key regions where the land grab is taking place, right? Or no, you should say. <laughs> That's how he wrote it. Yeah, well, it does. The IPCC has done its best to try to chart some of these projections about where we're going to have droughts and where we're going to have floods and the like. Basically, um, the overall question has been answered uh, more thoroughly by people like Bill Muma out at Tufts University, who worked for years for the IPCC in summarizing the science of the world on this issue. And the emphasis has been on things are going to be more what they were like. In other words, drier places are going to get drier. Uh, 
wetter places are going to get wetter. And in the process, the basic temperature is going to be increased in all areas. But this means that severe weather can be quite dramatic and quite devastating to agriculture in any one area. Um, and droughts can be more prolonged, uh, maybe going into two or three hundred year periods. <laughs> I mean, really strange weather. This is not so much um, climate change as climate weirding, as John Holdren um, put it. It's not global warming, it's global weirding that we're going to be up against. And he uh, mentioned this for years while he was in government and then in the, the, um, the Woods Hole Research Center since then. Um, but people are, are looking at the stability of agricultural production on the Earth's surface are getting increasingly concerned about water supplies and especially the vulnerability of irrigation systems that were so much a feature of the Borlaug Green Revolution effort. It was a package of irrigated water plus all the pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that you applied, all of which are becoming more expensive at the same time that water supplies are diminishing and becoming more and more polluted uh, from uh, other efforts, um, as well as agriculture, but other efforts like fracking um, in large parts of the world for oil reserves. So the, the trajectories are not good. They're going in the wrong direction. Relocalize, re autonomize seems to be the long range strategy for uh, self-sufficiency, now that the UN is em embracing this notion of food self-sufficiency, or what they're calling it, food security. Um, now you find all the same organizations that promoted agricultural exports several decades ago are now saying, oh, we got to worry about food sufficiency. Um, so, yeah, keep an eye on the weather maps and the new projections of what they're going to mean as close as you can to the IPCC and other local uh, science uh, organizations. But don't bank on um, predictable weather. That's going to be the very um, the big joker in the pack, in a sense, is the, the switch. And globally, the problems come when the American Midwest can't deliver the grain supplies floated down the St. Lawrence uh, River and distributed to the world. Uh, they were called miracle crops because they were, <laughs> they were planted in Iowa and they came up in Burundi, right? I mean, this is, if you look at the global grain trade, um, it's more and more dependent on long distance. That's not a good strategy in a period for, for um, stability in a period of climate abrupt shift. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, we're, we're over time now, so I'm sorry to the folks who have questions outstanding. Um, hopefully they can reach out to you, Tim, via email. Sure, um, or we can look, um, if anyone wants to do it, they can, uh, let's see if I can share the last slide here. Basically, you can, the last slide, and with an iPhone, um, catch up on things. In other words, this is, uh, let's see if we can run through it here. But basically, I can't summarize this in such a way that's useful, but you can scan in the QR code and get to uh, the supporting information behind this on a website that has now about 60,000 uh, links off of it. So you're welcome to use whatever you can get access to. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, so yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, a couple upcoming events. Um, next Monday, we will not be having a Rodney. It is the um, Patriot's Day holiday here in Massachusetts. Uh, but our, our next and final Rodney seminar for the semester will be um, Monday, April 29th, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time with Abdullah Sunai. Um, presenting on Projecting Life, FOCO, Learning, and Religiosity on a University Campus in West Africa. Um, your registration for today's event will also work for that. We also have on Wednesday, uh, April 28th, I think that is actually not, oh, that is April 28th, I'm sorry. Uh, the next routing is April 26th, I put the wrong date there. On Wednesday, April 28th, two days later, 6 p.m., we'll have our next uh, Cinema Freak film discussion about Fatima. Um, you can watch the film if you're Billy BU affiliated with the link I put there um, in the chat. And then finally, there's our full events calendar that you can see at the end. Um, so th thank you all so much. Thank you, Tim, and uh, we'll see everyone soon. Thank you very much, Eric, for setting all of this up and managing it. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Special thanks are due to Eric Schmidt, Fallon Gum, Elsa Vihe, Dr. Gerald Rizzo, and Lucia Lovinson Golub. They, in fact, direct 
and staff the Afetera collection, the cartographic free library that's been very helpful in this research. Dr. Rizzo has amassed an enormous collection and made a lot of it available to international scholars in digitized form. We all owe him a great debt. He's been an active member of the African Map Circle and helped launch the meeting at the African Studies Association last year. In addition, Beth Resnick, Gabi Odunya, and Rachel Dwyer deserve thanks for their help in the library. Ellen Messer over the years has provided guidance and insight from her own work in food and nutrition issues around the world. And the entire group known as the Africa Map Circle deserve thanks for their assistance as well. And of course, the students, scholars, and colleagues over the years in Yale's, Harvard's, and BU's African Studies programs all deserve thanks. This is part of an ongoing series of research projects on Africa's industrious revolution and the Atlantic empires, the prior plantations and the origins and functioning of the Atlantic system. Africa's prior plantations supplied both the food and the manpower for four centuries to create and sustain multiple European empires in the Atlantic. It's referred to as Africa's industrious revolution because it wasn't an industrial revolution. It was based on sheer human manpower, not the use of draft animals for the most part. And yet it's that manpower that created the crops and built the forts and the entire infrastructure for the export agriculture and the export of manpower over the Atlantic for tens of millions of people. This is ongoing research that needs to take into account both the historical cartography, the forthcoming archaeology of the different forts and garden plots, and in fact, entire plantations that supply the food for the transatlantic trip. These then are some of the troubling chapters in the political ecology and history of West African agriculture. The prior plantations, legitimate trade, cash crop exports, and farmland grabs are all part of a continuous history. And they're troubling chapters to begin with and to end with. Dan McCall inspired some of this research to begin with, with his emphasis and appeal for further works in ethnobotany. Other agronomists like Rene Dumont underscored the fact that Africa could develop, but it was taking a wrong start in the early 60s, growing without developing. And of course, historians have underscored how Europe underdeveloped Africa precisely by emphasizing export agriculture in cash crops, while Africa, came, Africa as a whole came to depend upon imports of foodstuffs. So this is something that takes a look at the full sweep of agrohistory in West Africa and will continue for years to come with further archeology, span historical cartography, and detailed study of the agricultural policies of colonial empires continues. <laughs>